Welcome to Affecting Autism. This week we have a, an, an episode about music and music therapy, which is something that we haven't discussed at Affect Autism, so I'm thrilled to have with us Dr. John Carpente, who is an Associate Professor of Music Therapy at Malloy College in New York City, Founder and Executive Director of the Rebecca Center for Music Therapy, and Founding Clinical Director of the Center for Autism and Child Development at Malloy College. He also is the owner of Developmental Music Health Services, LLC, and founding music therapist and creator of the DIR Floor Time based music therapy program at the Rebecca School in New York City, where he participated in weekly supervision and case conferences with Dr. Stanley Greenspan, who, um, of course, originally came up with the DIR, the Developmental Individual Differences Relationship Based Model that we talk about all the time here at Affect Autism. So welcome, Dr. Carpente. Thanks, Daria. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, it, it's great to have you. And um, I, I just wondered if you could tell our listeners a little bit about how you got into music therapy and how the program started at the Rebecca School, which you're no longer doing, but you um, started it. And the center that you're working with now is also called Rebecca, but they're not associated with each other, except that they do the same type of work, is my understanding. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, tell us how you how you came into music therapy and how you came into DIR floor time, because I forgot to mention, you're also a DIR expert training leader, which is um, um, somebody who has is um, qualified to train others in the developmental individual differences relationship-based model. That's right. That's right. That's a mouthful. Um, well, I, I've been a musician, you know, most, well, I'm still a musician, you know, my whole life. And uh, as a performer, I did a lot of recordings and touring, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, I was looking for something else, you know, and I found music therapy, luckily. And um, I was, uh, I did my undergraduate at Malloy College, where I teach now, uh, on Long Island in New York. And then there was a, an opportunity to train at the Nordoff Robin Center for Music Therapy at New York University. And so um, I did that, and um, that model is very humanistic, and it is, it's completely child-centered. At that point of my studies, I was never really exposed to the DIR model. <clears throat> didn't, I, didn't, I don't think I even heard of it. And so um, fast forward, you know, I ended up doing my PhD at Temple University. At the same time, I began working at the Rebecca School. But it's funny, how I got to the Rebecca School um, was I was all prepared to sell myself, you know, to start this program there. To Tina, Tina was, was the, the, the founding uh, director and Gil was the founding clinical director. Um, they weren't slated to have music therapy. They were slated to have art therapy, but not music therapy. But so through a mutual colleague, friend, um, I got uh, Tina and I connected and she invited me to this conference room, the school wasn't even built yet. They didn't even know where they were gonna have it. <laughs> where They knew they were going to have it, and that Dr. Greenspan would, would be a, a core component of it, but they didn't know where it was going to be. But at that point in time, I didn't know who he was. So I bring my videos in hand, because you know we always, the way I work is I always record my sessions, and, and um, I play, I'm playing the video as me and a, and a child interacting with music, and um, Gil and Tina are watching them, Preparing already, so here I have to go. I have to explain everything of what I'm doing. And the moment I, I was about to open my mouth, Tina and Gil both said, oh, you do floor time. And I looked over, I said, really? And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't want to say it, like, what's that? You know, what's floor time? Because I didn't know, I've heard of it now, but I didn't really know much about it. And I didn't know anything about it, to be honest. And so um, they began, they, they could see everything that was going on in the video. And that was so odd to me. Generally, folks who are not music therapists, it's, it, 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 a lot of times it's hard for them to see what's going on because a lot of people view fun as not therapeutic. And uh, they, they don't really get the nuances of what's going on musically and that it's a clinical way of thinking and working, but it's within the context of music. But they picked up on it so quickly. And I was like, wow, I need to work with these folks. You know, it's, I don't have to sell this. <laughs> they get it, you know. And... Um, once I left the meeting, I started reading everything on, on DIR. I think Engaging Autism had just come out. Um, 
And so I was just, I turned the page, oh wow, I would resonate. I do this, I do this, but I didn't understand the theory behind it. It was just something that um, I think people who work in this model, floor time, um, this is something, how we live our life. Mm -hmm. And then when we start reading up, oh yeah, this just naturally resonates, you know, with me. But I didn't understand why it works. So the more I, st I studied and then uh, became part of the Rebecca School, they offered me the, the position there. And, uh, and I was fortunate enough to be part of the early trainings. I mean, the stuff was gold. And I got paid for this. You know, it was, it was just, it was amazing. And um, I started to, to try to understand, like, how my role as a music therapist can fit in within the model because it's never really been done before. Um, and um, the colleagues there were great, you know, the different disciplines and trying to understand how each thing works within the context of one kid. Um, but I was still struggling because, you know, in the DIR model, the, the I part is we want to understand the child's things that are getting in his or her way to be able to move up the developmental ladder. And some of them might have auditory challenges. So how does that work with music? Right? And um, if I don't do, if I'm not using music, does that mean I'm not a music therapist? So I had this identity thing going on because where I was trained, it's all about the music, you know? And so at the same time this was going on, I was, I was, I was preparing my dissertation proposal, my doctorate at Temple University and um, trying to figure out how these things work. So in music therapy, how I typically work is that there's a, a range of uh, instruments available to the child that do not require any musical skill on his or her behalf, right? So we have a, a variety of percussive instruments, drums, xylophones, things like that. And you know, piano, harmonic instruments such as piano, guitar, it's the therapist's job and to improvise music on the piano or guitar based around how the child walks into the room, maybe picking up on the tempo of the, the way he walks or picking up on some type of affective expression that he might be doing. It might be something he might be stimming on or vocally. So I'll try to find the tonality and things that people might try to stop the child from doing, like don't make those sounds. We embrace it and compose music around it. So it becomes communicative. So it becomes relational. When a child comes in and sees a drum and, and these two sticks, but to us it's a drum and stick, but for a child it might be just like, what's this thing that has white stuff around it and these sticks here, what do you, what, what, what? and you hit this stick that generates a sound that then talks to the other sound of the piano coming out of that big block, big wooden box. Like, so the abstraction in making music made sense to me that some kids might not understand that two instruments can communicate with each other and it becomes an extension of their, of the child, right? And so um, <clears throat> the child would come in and say, he finds the sticks and he just starts randomly beating, you know? And so what am I going to do? I'm not going to say that's not how you play that because anything he plays, it's my job to follow his lead and try to provide music that would accompany it, enhance it and make it and put it into some compositional form. So once we can do that, and we do that to a series of different types of music therapy techniques, um, such as like mirroring, things that you do in non-music contexts. So mirroring could be mirroring uh, the child's beating on the drum, maybe doing exact imitation, or me doing it on the piano, making it melodic, while he's, he's perseverating on the beating, right? But we have to get to him, him or her to engage first. And I don't know if, I, if he's letting me into his world right now. So I have to manipulate the music in a way to see, is he with me or is she with me? And so once that happens, it's not only following their lead. That's, I think it's a big misconception. The, lead. the kid can do whatever they want, and that's it. How do they learn if you just follow their lead? Well, that's not the deal. What happens is we follow their lead until there's some shared attention. And we see that there's some co-regulation going on. But now music therapists might change the tempo or the dynamic. Now it becomes therapist-led. Now what is the child going to do with that? Is he going to get faster? Is he going to get slower? Is he going to withdraw from the interaction because he doesn't know what to do? And so we find a lot of kids, not a lot of kids, but a good number, with the motor playing challenges, this is really nice. Because they, if you think about music making, it's this um, aesthetic temporal experience that requires, the music demands a response in a particular tempo. But let's say if the child falls off, so to speak, 
What's great about live music is that I can slow down. Or let's say if, you, if, if I see the piano might be too overstimulating for him or her, I can just use my voice. Or I can go to percussion and I can play drums. I remember this, this, this teenager I was working with at Rebecca School, as a matter of fact, great kid, but auditorily he couldn't handle the different sounds of music. So I saw he was pretty good. So I'm playing the piano. He comes to the piano door. He, he, had, he, he had limited words and he shut the piano door. And he just kept his arm on the door. So, okay. I go to the guitar, holds the guitar out for him. Right? I start like singing. He's holding his ears and holding them out. So I started whistling. <laughs> I start whistling. And now I start running around the room. And he's coming after me, but he's smiling. So look at all those circles that are going on without speaking. Then I stop. I come up to him. He comes up to me. And then I, 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 I leave him again. And I start whistling. Or it could be someone who can handle the, the, the bigness of those harmonic instruments where they come up and they just take your hand and they want you, you become like a, a music box. Okay, is it just cause and effect relationships here that I'm just this object of sound? Or can we have an aesthetic relational experience that's, that, that's, that's loaded with affect, you know? So when I play, maybe I do a glissando and I create a blues musical form and I leave spaces, and they look at me. He looks away, I start playing again, I get his attention. Now he starts beating the basic beat, right? Now he's looking at me, now we're beating the basic beat, and I'm playing in between his beats, I bring my voice in. I create, say, a call and response, right? Now he sings back the melodic rhythm, that's turn-taking and imitation. So all of these things that I wasn't really hip to, I wasn't really thinking developmentally um, when I got to, uh, learn about the DIR model. The other thing I wasn't thinking is that realizing that music can also be looked at even when conventional music making isn't being, isn't happening, right? So, for example, there was this little boy that I was working with who was very sens sensory seeking type of child, created a lot of movement, a lot of input orally. He could not hold sticks, it was just too much for him, so he just throw the sticks away. He couldn't take um, any type of instrument play. So we set him up on, uh, so these are the things that got in his way of being able to engage in music. That would be, those would be the, the eye, if you will, right? And so how can I meet his, help him meet his eye needs, in individual differences, so he's more available for interaction. So it's a means to a musical end. It's not about providing the sensory support so they have it. Now what do you do with it? It's like I'm providing this within the context of interaction. So I knew he liked a lot of pressure on his hands. And I joined him in his classroom, and we had a game chair for him, you know, the rocking game chair. And he's rocking to get that vestibular going. And he's kind of in his own world right now. And so I have the guitar, and I'm playing, and I'm singing, and I pick up on the rocking. Pick up on the rocking. I'm playing in a detached way. Now he's, he recognizes this. Oh, wow, when I stop, he stops. So the cause and effect type thing, he's understanding that he has impact you know, on the world. So that's levels one, two, three, and venturing into problem solving as well, right? Into shared problem solving, because he's figuring out that when he does something, I'm doing that too. But he wouldn't play instruments, so what I did was, I would come up to him, he could also hit, if you know, he feels, because he has a hard time expressing himself verbally, so that was his communication, uh, way of communicating. So I took the melody that was created, and I would put my hand out, and we would slap hands. We had, I call this like body percussion because he needed that input to stay regulated. And every time I'd hit, I'd sing a note. And now the beating became more basic because he realized that this was part of the music experience. As opposed to just slapping somebody's hand without it. You know, in this way that could be like off tempo. It, there's no organization to it. When I bring the melody in, it creates I would say more of a purpose and it, it's more meaningful, you know, because that was interaction. And now he starts non-verbally singing with me just based on the hand slapping and he's doing the rocking at the same time. So that would be something of unconventional music making. Um, there are times even to try to get the child into the, into the symbolic level of, of, of interacting where, um, we could get into songwriting if they understand that. That would re re require the generating of ideas. So they might not be at that level yet. But I brought pu puppetry into music making where we would um, uh, 
play music with the puppets or use the puppets as props to make the music, you know? Um, and, or where kids would play air guitar, make believe you're playing air guitar, right? So that, that, that would be some features of symbolism there. Um, and, and I do think just naturally when we music with someone, it's, it's, it's an abstract experience right? of two people creating sounds in their own place, but with the intent to connect with someone else. So that's, um, I guess, a little piece of it, how we've tried to connect DIR and music therapy. Because the way that the child plays music is a manifestation of where they are developmentally, and it's our job to figure that out. And um, we're doing it all within the context of this relational experience. So even with self-regulation, you know, we have a child, you might have a kid who's, who's having a hard time uh, maintaining focus or maintain, he's become dysregulated. And you, sometimes you might see folks that just focus on regulating him, just calming him down through say deep pressure. That's all they're doing. But the way I look at it is I can do this within the, within the context of relationship. So the deep pressure can then turn into music. And I sing along with, squeezing and try to get a response. So if I'm doing this with every note, hello to diary, ah, oh. <laughs> hopefully you would, you would say it back. Right? Okay, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so doing it with the, with the sense where the child's gotta come back. And if not, so it's not just about regulating him, it's about regulating him within the context of interaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, and this is what um, attracted me to your work and, and asking you to be on the podcast was I read this blog that you wrote called Facilitating Musical Interaction When Children Become Dysregulated in Music Therapy. What comes first, co-regulation or interaction? And you started to describe it very nicely there. And <clears throat> I, I have a bunch of questions about everything you said. It, it just sounds so wonderful. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about that, how, because this is really part of um, the goal of music theory, therapy, maybe for, for some kids, music is a way to get into that shared world with them. So, so um, you did mention a little bit about it, how some people say, you can't do anything unless you're regulated first. And so let's work on regulating the child. Whereas Jake Greenspan says all the time, no, we're always working on the first three capacities together, regulating engagement and that back and forth interaction together at once. And then you're saying it with a spin um, towards the music therapy, which is we're going to co-regulate through the music to work on self-regulation, which in a sense is also working on engagement and back and forth as well. Right, that's, that's exactly right. It's the same thing, it's just done in a musical context. Because the thing is, I view, I, I, I look at those moments is where, where the real therapy takes place, because we're helping the child develop resources to become self-regulated within an interaction, as opposed to doing it in an isolated way. So we hope that this goes across contexts, right? And so it's just like, how can we, how can we engage with him when he is dysregulated? Why do we always have to try to make him be happy? And, and, and uh, you know, let's sing a calming song. That's not gonna happen in the world, right? And not only that, I think if joining in on this dysregulation, because we also, depending on how they dysregulate, but let's say it's, it's very effective, you know? Um, we have to be at that state with them, you know? And in a sense, we're also saying, it's okay to be like this. We're here with you. Now, how do you get back? Right? And so it's really, because I look at the child as his or her own agent. I just provide the experience. They decide whether they want to join it. I just have to be skilled enough to cater it around their nervous system, right? So I look the same thing uh, that you, you mentioned about Jake saying we're working on one levels one, two, and three engagement. I'm sorry, self-regulation engagement and relatedness all at once, absolutely. Because what good is it if we're just providing them with the sensory support, waiting, and then we engage with them? Where, how are they gonna learn to be able to modulate their emotions themselves? So that, that's, that, I, I completely agree, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I think that's such an important point that I discussed with uh, occupational therapist Virginia Spielman um, a couple weeks ago in our blog uh, podcast called Sensory Lifestyle. She talked about how the goal is always to help the child be able to self-regulate, which they might need a lot of support in when they're younger, but as they get older, we're, we're helping them figure out ways to recognize when they're dysregulated and how to get regulated and to be able to seek, ask for, or find it in whatever way, ways that can help them regulate themselves because as they get older, um, that's what they're going to need to function in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And so that's why I think one of the, you know, in working in a developmental way, we're not looking at isolated behaviors. You know, we're looking at the child as a whole, and this is one of the foundational things. You know, and if we look at the research, trends in autism research, first of all, you do not see any more ABA studies that look at isolated behaviors. You don't. You don't. What you're seeing now is more what they call naturalistic developmental behavioral, which makes no sense because they're antithesis of each other. But you'll see them using, they're using a blend of both, right? Behavioral strategies and developmental strategies such as following the child they're looking for their interests. But you see things are conceptualized within a social context now. Mm-hmm. And that the research is showing that these things are generalizing more than they ever did if you were looking at just isolated behaviors because the child's in need look for that same reinforcer every time you're trying to, say, manage his self-regulation. You know what I mean? So uh, one of the great things about this model, one of the many great things about this model, is that everything is done through relationship. I think it should be R-I-D. Relationship, <laughs> individual differences, development. You know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, I, and I was just curious, how do you... Um, get into the world of working with children with developmental challenges, such as autistic children. It is music therapy isn't necessarily only for children on the spectrum. Um, was there something that just led you there, or was it because of the Rebecca School? Um, it was because of my experiences at NYU initially. I never wanted to work with kids. I wanted to work in, in psychiatry with adults when I was doing my master's degree a long time ago. Um, but when I went to the North Robin Center, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular uh, music therapy approach that's a postgraduate, involves a postgraduate training. It's tied to New York University. And the first day I went, I'm getting chills even thinking, the first day I went there, I heard the music and the kids engaging and giggling. I said right there, this is what I'm doing. I didn't realize that was the only one, it's only one of a kind center. I thought this center grew on trees, but it's a very unique place. And that became the impetus for the Rebecca Center. So I wanted to create a place just like that. When I got to the Rebecca School some years later, well, that showed me, it reinforced the way I want to work. Because there are a lot of things that, um, there are a lot of gaps in my work, but things that I didn't even know were gaps until I went to the Rebecca School. Um, and learning the model and being part of the trainings, um, I realized for me, there were the, 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 the missing links of, you know, helping me figure out my role, my identity as a clinician. How can I best serve, you know, the kids using the skills that I have? And that place changed my life. It changed my parenting, my own kids. It changed how I work. It changed how, changes how, changed how I teach in the, in the college classroom. Um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm very lucky. That I, I was very, very, very lucky to have been there and gone through it, yeah. And, and now everything we do here at the Rebecca Center is all conceptualizing that model. And just last year, I wanted to create a clinic style of Rebecca School. So we launched the Center for Autism and Child Development right out of the Rebecca Center here at Malloy. And that center, the goal, the vision, is that all of, uh, that all of the clinicians, all the, uh, 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 from all the different disciplines that are, that are here at the college, speech, music therapy, psychology, et cetera, we all work within the model, DIR model. And this would be a one-stop shopping for parents. To, so, so the treatment's not frag, fragmented like a child might be. Everyone's speaking the same language. And the goal is to get into all of these divisions at Malloy, 
to show that all kids should learn this way, not just kids with developmental challenges, but all kids. That's kind of like my passion right now. Um, but working with kids with autism has always been, you know, my, that's the core for me. Um, it's been so fulfilling, I've been, you know, like blessed. And it's just a privilege to be able to make music with these kids. It's just, you know, and then you, and then you become part of their family. You know, and some kids I, I've seen, they're in college. I've worked on them since they were five years old. Uh, this one child I knew since he was in pre-K, and then he outgrew our program. About junior high school, I grew the program. I always kept in touch with mom, and then we kind of, you know, lost track. And I was doing an open house here at Malloy for, for students, and I see him outside the door. <laughs> and I see his mom, I'm like, oh my God, you know, what are you doing here? He's six foot two, and he's a communications major. Wow. <laughs> of all majors, you know? And um, yeah, it's just, it's just amazing, you know? And so, um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I get all worked up thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Um, I remember Dr. Tippy. You you mentioned him as Gil a, a number of times here. The uh, clinical director at the Rebecca School, um, founding clinical director. He's now starting the Shrub Oak International School uh, about an hour away from you. But he showed this wonderful video and and talked about how uh, <clears throat> there was a girl at the Rebecca School who. They just couldn't figure out how to get into her world. And one day, like literally by accident, um, the music therapist there, who I don't think was you, if, if I remember correctly, but it might have been, <laughs> started playing some classical music on the piano. And she just like, boom, like woke up, came to the piano, and she'd never had training. And she started playing classical music on the piano. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you even know who that was, but it was a video that Dr. Tippy showed. And um, I just wondered um, if you could speak a little bit about um, this whole musical prodigy and autism thing, because a lot of times people uh, that aren't that familiar with autism think, oh, you know, autistic kids, they have these special abilities like Rain Man who could count matches in cards that fell or or they're musical geniuses, or I, literally yesterday I went to bring in my son's pants to get patches put on because he slides on his knees, so every pair of pants has a million holes in the knees, so I'm explaining to this guy, found a new place to get it done because the other place I didn't like, and and he, as soon as I said, my son is autistic, he said right away, oh, my daughter's in neuropsychology and she's working this professor and he has a son who's autistic and he knows the whole TTC, which is the Toronto Transit System schedule, and he's never even rides the bus or anything, but she says where she wants to go, and he says, go here in five minutes, get this bus, take it to this stop, and then do this, transfer here, and he knows it all in his head, and so he was basically saying to me, like people do when they're trying to make a connection, oh, I know something about autism, those kids are brilliant. <laughs> they have challenges, but they're brilliant. And so I'm just wondering about some of your experiences because certainly not all kids are musical. Um, our son seemed to always like music. I've always played music and, and rocked with him as a baby. Um, Michael Jackson passed away when he was a baby, so we'd listen to Michael Jackson and be rocking him. And, and he's heard lots of music and then it's all the Thomas the Train songs and all the other childhood songs and I always change the lyrics to things that he's interested in and he always seems to enjoy that but he's he's not able to clap to rhythm yet or anything like that and only recently he loves Paw Patrol like all little kids <clears throat> um he he start, started singing while we're driving I hear him saying and it's not in time and it's not on key and it's you know all of that, the tempo isn't there, but he's singing this song from Paw Patrol, like, friends, 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 we are all friends, yeah, and he knows all the words, and it's just so cute hearing this little voice singing, um, so, you know, it's, it's, um, he, he will never be a mu musical prodigy, maybe, but there's still something about music that can um, touch people, so I'm just curious about your experiences with with kids that are musical prodigies versus kids that aren't. And, and you talked a lot about how you interact with them, but if you had anything else to say about it. 
Yeah, um, I mean, I, I know what you mean. A lot of folks think you know the savants are that's that's typical, but it's it's rare to 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 find uh, kids who could just come to the piano and play Mozart. Um, but overall, music, I think, um, it's patternized, right? The music, uh, there's sequences of music. Uh, music involves mathematics too. And I know for some kids, a lot of people confuse being musical to being musically sensitive or aware of musical patterns. Um, where like, you'll play with a child who doesn't seem like he or she's really with you, but knows that you left the beat off the last measure to fill it in. So if I went, you know, ba da ba da ba, and then they, they, they know how to do it. So anytime there's a space, they know. Now, is that musical? I don't think so. I think it's more about stimulus response, causing, it's more like stimulus, no, I gotta fill in. There's a beat that needs to be played there. There are kids that have perfect pitch. They're born with perfect pitch. But generally, I found kids on the spectrum that have perfect pitch have poor filter sy filtration systems auditorily. So they hear everything. It's hard for them to you know, find the important sounds that are going on without being distracted. And so you'll sing in a particular tonality that they want. And if you divert from that, that could be a problem. And for them, that could be, that might, we don't know how that sounds like for them. That could be like us putting our nails to a chalkboard. We don't know. There was a kid I remember I was working with at Rebecca School uh, who was hard to engage with. And he seemed to always get distracted easily auditorily. So this particular day, I wasn't working with him. He was out of the, my music room. He was, in the class, he was in the hallway, probably about 20 feet from the music room. So I'm working with this other kid. Now, the music room is not soundproof. It's kind of soundproof, but not really. You can hear some. But if you've been to the Rebecca School, you know there's a lot of action going on in the hallways, right? So I'm playing on the piano, and I'm working with this child in front of me. And the other child is out in the hallway. I don't know this yet, but I, I'm picking up, like, sounds coming out of the door. And when, every time I change tonality, that sound is changing. So now I, you know, I... I I said to myself, okay, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to interact with the kid in front of me right now. I'm going to change the music. I want to hear what's going on out there. And so anytime I would change, he's screaming outside would change tonality. So that interaction, oh, that wasn't an interaction. That was just an experiment. Explained to me that Tommy has uh, great auditory memory and sensitive auditory skills, but at the same time is ha has a hard time taking things auditorily in because it's getting – He's getting confused. Then you have kids. So I see like there's certain elements of music that kids might have propensities for. Um, melody and rhythm are two that seem to be, and the research shows this too, cognitive science, cognitive, not music therapy research, but cognitive neuro, neuro research. Um, and I think because melodies are repetitive, you know, when you listen to music and you have, in, 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 in Western music, it's very predictable what's going to happen. You have your, your, your verse, you have your chorus, you have your verse, your chorus, and the way the melodies are contoured, they transmit where it's going to go. And so some, a lot of the kids have a sensitivity to that. This is why I think music can be a way in for some of these kids. As far as the, uh, the savants, you know, is the one that I've never, no, that's not true. I did work with a savant once. She blew me away. I worked with, for one day, I had to do it, someone uh, hired me to do an assessment. And what would happen was I'm on the guitar, she's on the piano, and I'm changing tonality, key, meter, and she's with me every single, like, not a beat off. She had such flexibility and such ease at the keyboard, it just blew me away. But yet she needed to be shown how to find the room, even though she knew where she was going, you know? And that's the thing, too. So with her, she was able to switch and shift, but I think it was more of a cognitive exercise, uh, which, is, which is a component of music, but the emotional piece of music, connection. Uh, it, she connected with the tones, but did not connect with the affect. You know what I mean? Um, because you can do music in an emotional type way on the touch and how you touch the keys. 
Now, someone who's that sensitive or understands musical systems that well, if I play softly, she's going to know how to do it, but I modeled it for her. The whole trick is, could she initiate that? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. At least not this particular person, you know? And so kids that I find that have these propensities, they learn quickly that they can use that to keep you from them because they're giving you what you want. <laughs> and you're like so blown away by this, but it's how they manage their space, you know? And we have it too. We, we, we have our shortcomings and we figured out um, how to make up for that in the world, otherwise you couldn't live. It's when it gets in the way of our living that it becomes pathology. So uh, things like that, whether it's a child, like this, this, this girl I was talking about who, who, can, who can play anything on the piano, or if it's someone who has a propensity for melody, where they can hear something, and not only do they, they can repeat the melody, they can repeat the timbre, the quality of the voice. But how much of that is, is memory versus spontaneous interaction? Right? So if I leave the room, they'll still be singing it. Right? So I, I, we have a lot of parents that come here that are new to music therapy. And they go, well, um, they'll tell us about the, the, the child's musical history. And they'll say, oh, uh, little Johnny loves music. He knows every Beatles song. He knows every lyric. He knows every song order of the White Album or whatever it is. And you know, this is an actual story, by the way. And you know, just the other day, we, we took him to a restaurant. Now, he hadn't been to in three years, and he knew the exact route of how he did it three years ago. So I said, uh, and then she goes back to the Beatles songs. Can you play these songs? Can you do sing-alongs? I said, well, you know, we, don't do, we don't really do sing-alongs here. That's not what we do. But I want to go back to what you said earlier about all these things that he remembers. What happens if you change a lyric? Or if you were to take the diff a different route to the restaurant, what would happen? Well, he would have had a hard time. He doesn't let me sing to the radio. I have to let it play. I said, well, that's where we come in. You see, we take the starting point. Say he needs a Beatles song as a transitional object, so to speak, you know, to make him feel safe. And we'll be there for him, you know? But eventually, you might want to try to divert from that and see if we can get more spontaneous interaction. And I find some of the kids who are very um, sensitive to musical systems have a harder time abandoning that because that's what they've, hold, it's what, they, what they've held on to. It's similar to even outside of music, right, where kids that have all this, I don't want to say language, words, they have words, but it's hard for them to put it together in a spontaneous way, so they repeat. And then if that system is changed, and say you ask a why question based on the word, they might melt down, because now they have to use language in a more functional way. Same thing with music, I think, I think. You know? Yeah, it's so interesting. It's, it's everything that I know about floor time, but in a musical context, and yeah, it's, it's really great. Um, and, and it's funny because I know things that you mentioned about these other kids, like um, my son will remember the song that was playing at a particular place that we were at, you know, two years ago that we haven't been to and we go there and he'll say something about a song that was playing. like, how do you remember that? Like he remembers little particular things associated with people and places that he's been. And I guess that helps him feel safe or, or make order of the world. And, and similarly, he'll, you mentioned people that can repeat back. He, he will tell you and imitate exactly every sound that every one of his classmates makes. So this kid goes, no, 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 no. And this kid goes, oh, no, no, or whatever. I, I, I can make all the different sounds, but the exact tone, the exact way he says it, he imitates perfectly. And, and you said, um, you know, can we, you know, you're talking about, um, kids displaying some sort of rigid type of behavior and, and us wanting to make them more flexible and how can we do that in a way that feels safe to them to sort of expand their experience. Um, <clears throat> I also wonder, I don't know if this is related or not, but you know, that, that may be my son's way of connecting with that child because the social face-to-face -face interaction piece is hard for him, but he likes that child he wants to be associated with that child. He wants to interact with that child. And by imitating the sounds that, that child makes exactly the way <laughs> that he makes them is, is his way of connecting. And then using that as a bridge to then sort of foster some more 
spontaneous interaction and initiation and all of that stuff. So I, I just, I, it's so interesting to me how it all relates. And I, now I understand exactly what you meant when you said you were um, expecting having to explain what you do to Dr. Tippy and, and Tina McCourt when you met them at the Rebecca school and they're like, Oh, we, we totally get everything you're doing. It's exactly what we do. So I, am at, I, I can totally relate to how you must have felt like, Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I have to be here. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a way to foster children's musical ability if parents and family or whatever and the child actually wants to I remember I took um, I was working <clears throat> um, at the University of Maine for a number of years temporarily and as an employee I was allowed to take courses for free so I just decided to do hobbies so I took you know an art course and I took a, a voice class and the voice teacher said um, anybody can learn how to sing I don't care what your ability is or whatever I, anybody can learn to sing and I remember remembering that because I thought well wait a second I thought you have to be able to sing on key you know know how the rhythm works and and have some kind of ability but but um can you take a child who maybe doesn't have musical ability and foster that well there's two different things here so then we, we kind of one is music education right where you're teaching them a musical skill and some folks can do that or then there's music therapy where it's not so much of teaching them how to be a musician or a drummer or whatever but providing them with musical experiences that would expand their range of communication relatedness so so we don't work on teaching stuff but what happens is they develop a natural inclination uh for things because then parents say, Well, he really loves the drums. Should I buy him something at home? Yeah, sure. This is what you, what you might want to check out. Or uh, he's always singing now in the house. He never sang before. Oh, that's great. How and then might ask, how can we foster that? Um, we do have a lot of parents coming asking for lessons. We do give lessons, but it's always done within a therapeutic context. And the child already needs a certain needs a certain skill set already built in before they can do lessons, take lessons. Um, like, because we have kids that come for therapeutic piano lessons, but that requires them to be able to sit at the bench and, uh, be, and, and, and take in the, the notes and whatnot. So we want to make sure, because some parents, you know, they, I get it, you know, they, a lot of parents don't, these kids don't have baseball and Little League and things like that. So this might be a way, and I get it. But we just try to, we don't want to discourage them, you know. We just say, maybe he's not ready for this now, but this is what we can do. To help him, so it wouldn't be. It's never really conventional music lessons. Um, it's really just that they have a propensity for singing. I'm not going to teach him how to sing on key. What I would much prefer is how can we do this through a range of musical experiences? You know, where it's more, uh, uh, is more affectively connected. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think it, it's really important that we brought this up because it is easy for a lay person to confuse music education and music lessons with music therapy, which has a, a totally different purpose, that being everything we discussed prior to that question I just asked, <laughs> um, which, which is also kind of what you're doing when you're um, telling somebody and, and educating them about what the DIR model is in general, is they're, they're seeing play, you said at the beginning, if people see us playing and having fun, they don't think that it's therapy. Nice. And same thing with DIR. If we're playing and having fun, well, wait, I want my children to know how to add and subtract and how to spell and how to read and how to do all this stuff. And and having to explain, well, this is more about that, um, you know, all of the different functional, emotional, and developmental capacities that allow then for the child to be able to pursue all of these other hobbies and interests in academics. Um, once these other capacities are, are more robust. Right, right, because if a child can't self-regulate or engage, he's not ready for academics at that point, possibly. And that's a big issue, you know, and I can't, you can't fault parents, I totally get it. But that, that's, a, that's a really big thing. And the other thing, too, is that I, we also, I also do conventional DIR, floor time here, is 
how can we do floor time within the context? Oh, I'm sorry. How can we teach a child how to add within the context of floor time? Because you can do that while you're self-regulating and engaging. It can be part of the activity, but it has to come from him or her, the child. And I, for some reason, social emotional skills does not hold enough weight as, as academic skills, but those are the most, without those, academics doesn't really come out. Because right, if you, if you can't abstract, you'll never divide. You'll never learn to do division. You'll never learn to, have, uh, to read a book without pictures. If, if, you, if you have a hard time with symbolism and, and, and abstraction, or understand science, or, or things that are more abstract in the world. Um, and I, know, I think that's a, that's, a big, that's a big challenge for us developmental folks. I, think. I don't know if it's the same in Toronto, um, but it is here. It's a, it's a big difference. Yeah. I, I think what I find recently, just not that I keep up on everything, but um, there is a buzz towards social, social emotional skills and learning. And, and um, like Dr. Gordon Neufeld, he's a developmental psychologist out of uh, Vancouver. He, he doesn't talk about DIR, but he's so in line with that thinking because he talks about the developmental approach to parenting. And he says, you can't teach these things. So education is going about it the whole wrong way because you don't teach someone to be social. You don't teach them how to have social emotional skills. You don't teach them how to be emotionally connected with another person. It comes through relationship and in his language, attachment, uh, the way that the attachment is. And in the DIR world, it's all about the relationship. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's always a pleasure speaking with other developmentally minded people who do this work for a living and and hearing about all the different ways this work is being applied so dr newfeld through the parenting and and um dr tippy through his clinical experience and you through this musical experience and occupational therapists through through their work so um it's such a thrill having you on today and i just wanted to thank you for taking the time to share all of this information with the listeners well, thanks for having me. I, 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 I appreciate it. You know, I can go on and on and on. Sometimes I think I talk too fast, but, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, it's great that you have this. It's so valuable for, for parents, uh, or not just parents, professionals, or anyone interested in this way, because we need to, 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 to bring this out there to folks. You know? So thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. And is there anything else you wanted to leave listeners with about musical therapy what you do and and specifically in the context of the dir approach oh, if you want to learn more about um, what we do here at the rebecca center for music therapy you can visit our website at www.therebeccacenter.org um, you could also visit dmhmusictherapy.com uh, to learn more about how the dir model and music work um, and feel free to email me um, if you have any questions or are you looking into some research, if you want to, look, want to find supportive research on how music therapy might work, um, at jcarpente, J-C-A-R-P-E-N-T-E, at Molloy, M-O-L-L-O-Y dot E-D-U. Um, yeah. Great. And I'm going to put links to everything that you just said and, and the stuff okay. that we talk about in the full blog post as well. But for people that are listening on podcast and and don't have access to the website, I'm glad you gave it out, um, at affectautism.com. Um, look for the blog about music therapy, and it'll all be in there. And, um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. And hopefully you'll come back again sometime, and we'll talk about something else related to therapy. <laughs> I'd love to. Thanks. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, well, thank you so much. And for our listeners... Until next week, here's to affecting autism.